And so I was like in the shower and they posted it. And my phone went ballistic. People I hadn't heard from in years, just like, yo, show you a bar stool. And they were doing like five, 10 million views. It was crazy. It was so crazy. Eliminate all thoughts of what if and what not. And just do one thing every day that's going to put you in the right direction. A lot of influencers or creators um, need to start understanding that it's not really about them. It's about... First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Nick Cassano, known online as Nikki Cass, you're a social media sensation, a comedian, an entrepreneur, and a baseball fanatic. Am I missing anything? Nah, I love my family, but that's about it. <laughs> is it Nick or Nikki? Just so I know throughout the podcast. You can call me whatever, man. Nick, Nikki. Let me say that we are excited and honored to have you on our podcast. Let me also say that you are hilarious. And that's coming from someone who is from your dad's generation. <laughs> my favorite skit of yours is the orangutan who's next in line at the deli. I can't get that out of my mind, although I love all your work. Hilarious. I think I, th- I think that's a, something I did a while back, but hey, man, the honor is all mine. I really appreciate you guys making the time, and I'm excited to kind of talk to you and, and just be a part of it. I know Adam speaks so highly of this show, you guys, and Adam's a dear friend of mine, so um, I'm just I'm just excited to be here, and I, I appreciate it. My, and you know what's funny, too, Mr. Green, is – that's the beauty in the in the comedy. It's like you get the younger crowd, but really my niche is like that older, I not to say older, but that, you know, kind of father who's got kids and they got kids sort of vibe. So um, it really hits all all parts and I grew up around it. So um, yeah, it's just, it's been fun, man. Yeah, it's, it's hilarious. And you can tell you grew up around it. It's like, oh, dude. it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like that much acting. It seems like you're impersonating uh relatives yeah you know like people say all the time like oh are you ever gonna like you ever feel pressure to like make ideas and 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 create videos i'm like no because tomorrow something's gonna happen and i'm just gonna write it down and then i'm gonna make a video about it and it's gonna be great so it's (laughs) like you know i live at home i still live in the garage i'm 24 i just turned 24 so i got i got time us italians we like we nest we nest egg our people you know like we we stay if, if we're not living together we're two blocks down you know so I'm always around it. I'm engulfed in it. And, and like I said, all the craziness, you know, turning it into comedy has just been, you know, therapeutic and also like just so much fun because it is so relatable. You're in good, uh, you're in good company where I'm my dad's neighbor. My brother's two houses up the street. My beautiful. older sister's across the street. Ah, it's beautiful. The only one that got away was Tate. Let's start back when you were just a kid. Do you have any siblings? What was your neighborhood like? Yeah. So, I grew up, uh, I have an older sister and her and I are kind of like the polar opposite. Like she was so studious, like in the book, she actually is a doctor of pharmacy. She's like the smartest person I know, but in the book, she's smart on the street. She's a little aloof. Um, me, I'm the exact opposite, not book smart at all. I love to learn things and like on the streets, I'm pretty good with people and I love talking to people if you can't tell already. But, um, yeah, my neighborhood was like, very just kind of just kind of normal like I grew outside of the city I grew up in the suburbs outside of New York City and uh it was a bag of trail mix you know you had Italians you had uh non-Italians a lot of different cultures I went to a public school um didn't wear a uniform every day but I was a kid that wore like shorts in the winter and everyone thought I was crazy um but my friend group like just traditional kind of just dudes I still hang out with them today love sports played a ton of sports growing up um 
yeah, it was, it was, it was great growing up in my town because again, like there were so many different people that you kind of encountered. And I think it's benefited me now in today's world where like, you know, what I do is very public. So, you know, whether it's somebody that, you know, is Italian or somebody that's not, it's just, it's very fun to kind of just meet everybody and talk to everybody. And I think it, it served me well because I'm, I'm an extroverted, I'm a little introverted too, but I like talking to people. And so, um, it just, it was great growing up where I grew up. Were you the class clown and that kind of stuff? Oh yeah, man. I, I, my, uh, the teachers that understood that I wasn't going to sit down and learn what's being taught <laughs> and just let me kind of do my thing. I, I, I still talk to this day. Matter of fact, when, uh, I did a video with the Stanley cup, like a year and a half ago for the NHL playoffs. And, um, uh, one of the teachers, her name is Miss Rice. Shout out, Miss Rice. She always just kind of let me do my thing. She knew, like, I'm not going to sit down. Like, I practice my baseball swing in the corner while she's teaching the freaking class. And uh, her son's a huge Ranger fan, huge hockey fan. So I invited him, her, like, when the Stanley Cup came. And, like, it was just a cool moment. But, yeah, no, I uh, I was just always making jokes. I was always just trying to make the team laugh. Like, you know, and, and I never really knew that that was kind of, like, a talent. Like I just did it. Cause it was kind of just came out. Um, but yeah, always the class clown. I, I took nothing. I still take nothing serious. I have to at certain points, but like, I'm just a kind of a goofball, you know? Did you have any of those teachers say you got to pay attention and you know, you'll never make oh. anything yourself. Oh yeah. I do it all the time. Like, and, and it's funny too. Like I always use this kind of like a chip on my shoulder. I mean, you know, there's, you always get that. And and I think like that underdog mentality has been huge for me too. But yeah, some teachers, you know, at the parent teacher conferences, they'd have my sister and then they'd have me. And with my sister, it was like, oh, what a tremendous student. She sits in the front of the class. She takes all of her notes. She doesn't say anything. And then they come to mind and they're like, wait a second, she's related to him. <laughs> it was fucking great. <laughs> uh. I didn't, I didn't quite have that big of a difference, but I had a similar, I was the first one to ever get a, you know, a detention, let alone yeah. you know, a- anything, right? Like my two older siblings, everything did everything. The, you know, teachers loved them, all that good yeah. stuff. No, not and me. I, yeah. Then when Tate, my younger sister came through school, she's like, can I tell people I'm related to Thane and Tessa, but not Troy? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, listen, school, you know, it's not for everybody. And you know, I think it turned out okay for the two of us. So um, it's just, it's funny, man. That's good. When did you first realize that you were funny? Was it at the dinner table with family or maybe when you were the class clown at school? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, my dad will tell you, you know, I always knew that he was going to be funny because, you know, the first, you know, he didn't say shit growing up, you know, until he was about two. And then the second he said one word, he talked full sentences and he would imitate all of our family members in front of everybody. And I always knew that he was going to be something that was in the comedy area. And so, yeah, I think like it first started out with just making fun of my relatives. And then, you know, once, once I like kind of figured out that like, I, like I can make somebody laugh and just like seeing their reaction. Like when I was very young, it was just like the most electrifying like feeling like, I don't know. For me, like laughter is such a pure moment. And when you laugh, you don't think about anything. It's just like, just this friggin' rush of just good stuff. And so to be able to give that to somebody else, uh, I just fed off of it at the dinner table, shit, like any negative situation, you know, just kind of trying to be the guy making it lighthearted, um, on the, on the bus rides to the games in the classroom, friggin' people I'm meeting for the first time. Yeah, you know, like I would meet people. I'd go to like the doctor's office with my mom because, you know, Italians, we go to the pediatrician until we're 25 and our mom comes with us and fills out the fucking sheet and all that. And I'd be sitting in the doctor's office and like the doctor would come in and like he'd had, you know, a long day dealing with parents, patients. And I just like bust his balls and he would laugh and it'd be like this nice, wholesome thing. And it would always be like a challenge to me when I meet you. Like I just want to give you a good laugh or a good chuckle. I've never met anybody. I say all the time that I can't make laugh or smile. And it's always a, a joke. Sounds a little corny, but I don't know. I just think that it's, it's important. It really is. Like nobody's that serious. Like let's fuck, like let's crack a little bit, you know? Baseball obviously plays a big role in your life. 
uh, not only in your comedy content, but also in the way you approach things. When did you first fall in love with baseball? I went to a, a Mets game when I was really young. We were sitting, it was back when it was Shea Stadium. I was probably like uh, five and we were sitting all the way up in the top deck and I got this little Mets bat and I remember just like taking it home and just like holding it and kind of just like taking dry swings and you know, like as the years like went on, like I started falling in love with like like the players like David Wright and like just watching them on TV, uh, Derek Jeter. Like I wasn't always – like I wasn't like a, a Mets fan or a Yankees fan. I just love baseball and I just love New York and – I always just kind of gravitated towards like the scrappy guys that like hustled and like worked hard. And then um, when I was really in middle school is when like my love for the game turned into like a real passion. And I, when I tell you, I became like obsessed. I would in the winter, you know, in the Northeast, it snows friggin' four months out of the year and you can't play baseball. So I would bring a, a shovel in my car when I was able to drive and I'd shovel the field after school and I'd like hit and I'd like hit in the cage, my homecoming dance, I called my coach and I was like, Hey coach, you know, like I'm not really feeling this dance thing. Like call the town. My, like my bat is in my car. I got baseballs. Like tell him to turn the lights on, on the field. And I'd like beg him to call the town and they turn the lights on and I hit. And I just, I love the idea that I could take a thousand swings and I'll never be perfect. And I just kind of fed off of like the pursuit of just getting better. And I think honestly, that's what's helped me so much in like what I do now because I'm so process driven and I'm not results driven. And I think the not having to worry about the results, cause I know I'm going to fail seven out of 10 times. Like at least I get to pick up the bat and go swing it again. So a very long winded answer, but um, yeah, I went, it started when I was young, but then I really just like fell over, fell in love, like middle school, high school. I heard that you were maniacal in the way you approach things. Can you please give us an example? <laughs> I'm having a bit of trouble because I don't know what maniacal means. I'm so sorry. I'm the worst. <laughs> I'm just not a good bookworm, man. That's great. That's a great story. So when I got to U I went to UCF down in Orlando to play football. Okay. And I had I played uh I played as scholarship, all that good stuff. And I'm there with the team and they're like, Yeah, there's this big, you know, uh lunch. And this was before NIL, so it was like a fundraiser for the team for whatever. And they're raising money and they got all these big wigs there. And they're like, Yeah, the the speaker is Tim Green. I'm like, what? I didn't even know he was doing the thing. No way. My dad walks up there and his entire speech, Nick, was about how you have to be maniacal if you want to play in the <laughs> NFL. But it wasn't just about being maniacal in football. It's being maniacal in the classroom. Maniacal. It's like when yeah. you're – so half my team at the end of the speech, half my team came to me and said, basically what you just said, hey, that was awesome, but what the hell does maniacal mean? <laughs> it's like when you're so – you're like insanely driven. So it's like, oh, it's yeah. not just like, it's more than working hard. It's like, you're cr almost crazy with it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm the most maniacal on the planet, if that's the case. So to give you an example, like I, there's a quote of, and Conor McGregor said it, I'm not uh, the biggest fan of him now, but I used to be like super, a big fan of him. And he said, I've lost my mind in uh, this game of fighting, but in losing my mind, I've found it. And I think what I'm, I'm so like, I am so maniacal about waking up every single day and doing the same things over and over again. And I don't care how I feel and I don't care how it looks like for me, I'm so maniacal about the process and the consistency of it. But in a very technical perspective, like if I go to create a video and I have a, idea of what it's going to look like in my head before I go to shoot it. I'll know like when we set up the camera, i like my, one of my guys, Lucas will have the, the tripod and I'll be like, all right, Lucas stand here. And if he stands an inch and a half to the right, I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's not where you're supposed to stand. You're supposed to stand right there. And to him, he's like, it's literally, you can't even notice the difference. And I'm like, no, 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 that inch and a half is three miles in my head. And so I'm super maniacal about, uh, specific things of like the content and how it's going to look and also my work ethic. And I think um, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about it. I'm constantly uh, trying to improve, but I'm 
I'm doing it not because I'm afraid of like not it being good enough. I'm doing it because I absolutely love uh, doing just self improvement. Like for me, entrepreneurship is the maniac- maniacal person's dream because like you are constantly fine tuning. Like sometimes I even think about buying a big rock and getting a little stone and like just chipping away at a sculpture at a stone because I know at some point it's going to look like this beautiful thing and I'm just. I'm trying to hit the stone every single day to that point though, while I'm insanely maniacal about production of like really little things, big decisions, I'm not maniacal about it at all because I feel like big decisions are going to come and go and there's not one ship that comes into the dock. So like with opportunities, I'll walk away from a lot of things because of what have you. And I don't really stress about the, the big stuff, but the little stuff, I'm so maniacal about because in baseball it was like, you know, my, the, the people that were around me were like the way you tuck in your Jersey, the way the glove put, goes in your hand, the way you put on your cleats, like, you know, my equipment, like the, when I'm done with, with my day, my pen goes on the right side of my keyboard. Um, I, I put my glasses on the top left corner. I wipe my desk off. It's not OCD. Cause I don't feel uncomfortable if I don't do it. It's like, I need to do this because the preparation for today is setting me up for tomorrow. And I, live by that so that was a long-winded answer out of a word i didn't know but i guess i'm pretty maniacal <laughs> because <laughs> i my, my my yeah my godmother told me um a long time ago how you do anything is how you do everything and so i always make sure that how i do the little things um is the most important because it's going to translate to the big things so like i don't know even even the way you know you get dressed in the morning like all that shit fucking matters it really does the music I listen to, I don't listen to. Now you got me going, Mister Green. Now the the music I listen to, I don't listen to music with lyrics before like one o'clock. Um, I sit in silence in the car on my way to the gym and on my way back because like anything that I feed my brain in the morning is going to have an effect on the rest of my day. And like when you wake up, you want to make sure you're putting good stuff in your body. When my eyes crack open, I say, "My name is Nick Cassano, and only good things happen to me." I say it like twenty times. I'll read my goals. Like I'll do all these things that kind of, you know, prime me for an effective day. And for some people that's corny and I really could give less of a shit because it works and I'm happy as hell. (laughs) If it's working, don't change it. Yeah. Why would I change it? No, I think that's, that's a big thing. All that like manifestation and stuff like that's really, and it's starting to get popular. Kind of, kind of Conor McGregor and Tony Robbins, that kind of, yeah. And it's, it's, it's getting big now. Yeah. Yeah. I used to do a, a Tony Robbins meditation every morning and I don't, I'm not a drug guy. Um, but I'd imagine it's the same feeling I get after that meditation is like the same one someone get if they eat like a mushroom, like everything's awesome after that meditation. And I'm just sitting there in my eyes closed, breathing in and out. I have no idea, but it might be like, I'm like euphoric crack an egg in the pan. I'm like, Holy shit. Do you see that? Like it's, it really is something else. After high school, you were playing baseball and studying marketing at Montclair State, planning on becoming a personal trainer. So break this down for me on the timing that led to your first post on TikTok. Okay. So freshman year, uh, I was playing baseball. I was taking 18 credits and I was uh, studying to become a personal trainer. I got certified. Um, I was training clients out of my garage and then I transferred school. So I transferred to a SUNY school. Um, cause I, the, the baseball Montclair, my freshman year had a little bit of trouble with like, uh, just the, the coaching staff, um, and the team were like, weren't really meshing well, but I still wanted to play. So I went to New Paltz and I was training clients, but then I kind of like lost the love for the game. Um, which was a very confusing thing for me because I was obsessed with it for so long, but nevertheless, um, I was training clients out of, uh, the New Paltz gym. And then uh, TikTok was like kind of out and people were using it and like they were making videos and whatnot. And my friends would always like push me to like create videos and, and post them because I would create videos, but I just send them to my friends because I thought I was like a clown. I would do like how to make the best grilled chicken and I put my hat sideways and I'd wear like a, a like a guinea tea and I'd like go, oh, then you got to put this on and fuck it. And then I'd like send it to my friends like, oh, this is great. Post it. I'm like, ah, nah, whatever. So I'll never forget, it's uh, February of 2020, 7.52 p.m. on a Wednesday. And 
I made a video of like Italian dads versus non-Italian dads when you're telling them you're going out. And so the non-Italian dad's like, sure, pal, see you whenever. Like, don't worry about when you're coming home, blah, blah, blah. The Italian dad's like, hold on a second. It's 8 p.m. on a fucking Wednesday. Where are you going? What do you got to do? You're going out on a Wednesday. And so I made the video. It took me like five minutes to make. And I posted it. The next day, I woke up and the video had 2 million views. And I was like, all right, man, this is kind of not so... I freaked and I deleted the app and I didn't make a video for a little bit because it was just weird. Like, I don't know. I never kind of did this to be famous or get notoriety or whatever. I just thought it was funny. Uh, But then COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, there was nothing to do. I mean, I was sending like free PDFs to all my clients, how to maintain your gains during COVID, like all these fucking things. And so um, I just kept getting the itch to like make these videos again because I, again, I love making them. I love the creative aspect of it. And I love making people laugh, but I wasn't really like doing it to do anything other than that. So I was bored. So I made a video every day um, and didn't really know where I was going, but I knew exactly where I was going. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but I just felt the need to make these videos. And then uh, Barstool Sports got a hold of one of them. Um, it was like Italian dads at a T-ball game, which is like fucking good. Um, and they posted it. And from there on, they posted my stuff like three, five, ten times a month. And I just friggin', I mean, it just never looked back from there. Did they reach out to you about posting it or did you just got no. a notification that they shared it? No, I sent it to them. So I would like make these videos and I would like message these accounts, be like, hey, this would do well on your page. Again, like I just did it because like I, it was interesting. Like it was cool. Like, oh, let's see if they post it. Like they're never going to fucking post it. Share your shit. Oh, dude, this is awesome. It's going up tonight what? And so I was like in the shower and they posted it. And my phone went ballistic. People I hadn't heard from in years, just like, yo, show you a bar stool. And they were doing like five, 10 million views. It was crazy. It was so crazy. Did you, when you first saw, I mean, you said you kind of got nervous and deleted it, but when you first felt like almost the validation, right? Like you, you could make these videos and they could go viral. Was there a part of that, that that you liked it was almost like addicting that like the, the, the tick of fame yeah yeah it was it was it wasn't so much like the fame it was like the because i didn't i don't you know i don't need to be famous i'm not a big fan of being famous but um the the it was like the like when you play a game and you're good at it you want to try and beat your high score and for me it wasn't like oh let me see if more people will like me it was more of like let's just see if this does better numbers so i was chasing that and i wasn't really chasing like the approval aspect of it i was just chasing like a new high score um which i'm thankful for because before i got into social media i was pretty like uh, pretty good self-esteem like pretty kind of just like knew who i was sort of thing so i wasn't like kind of trying to chase any of that um so it was really just like i was 100 percent addicted to let's see if this one does better than the last, but not for the sake of like, Oh, I'm going to be more famous now because, because I, fame was tough in the beginning. I didn't really know how to deal with that. And if a video did, did worse than the, you know, than the previous one, was it disappointing at all? Or you just kept going? Yeah. And I was like, nah, all right, let me try another one. Like that's the other thing too, with baseball is just like reps, you know, like I'm going to roll over on a couple ground balls, but then I'll hit one and it'll be a seed. So I kind of just use that analogy and never really was like attached to the, to the, it wasn't even like the result. It was just more of like, let's see what happens. Like I felt that excitement every time, like, let's see what happens. And if it didn't do well, all right, let's see what happens this time. Like I was just addicted to the, let's see what happens. And then what did your, your boys say and your family say when you post that first video and it, and it popped off? Um, Well, it was a little like, it was a mix between like, that's awesome. And like, holy shit, you know, cause the, like people were fought like athletes, like celebrities were like following me, like from the jump. And like some of the guys I used to look up to in the baseball world were like, shoot me messages. And it was just like, what the fuck is going on? Like, this is so, and it happened so fast. Um, so there was a lot of excitement, but there was also a lot of like, what is this real? Like, this is so obscure. Like, it's just so beyond comprehension. It seems like the post blowing up would have been a reason to double down. Why did you shut it down after it went viral? I think, I think because I was scared of the idea that so many people were going to like see my face 
And like that kind of, that thought just kind of like scared me. Um, and plus like people are saying like, oh, uh, there was, I was getting a lot of hate on the video because like, it's not what Italians are like, like, you know, there's the Italian Americans and then there's actually like Italians that came from Italy and that community was kind of like, you're giving us a bad name. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like Nona lives downstairs. Like, you know, the family's from Calitri. Like we're, we're Italian. Like the, I know I'm blonde hair, blue eyes, but like, we're definitely old school Italian. Um, and so I don't know. I just like, I, I'm again, I'm big on environment. Like I didn't want, you know, a bunch of people hating on my shit and like me seeing that. And I was like, ah, I don't know if this is for me. I'm just kind of here to make people laugh. If they don't like it, boom, I'm out. And then plus like the idea of so many people viewing it kind of like, I don't know. Cause like now every time I'm seeing people, I'm like, were you one of those too many? Like, did you see me? You know what, what's going on here? Um, and so I deleted it, but then, um, I, when I, when I redownloaded it and started making uh, new videos, like I was like, all right, if, if the, the, the people from Italy think that this isn't a good representation, I'll make some old school Italian stuff. That's very relatable to them and they'll understand. And so I started making like, this no, no, like no, no stuff where, you know, she's five, two minutes ago. She's like, ma, you look okay. You gain a weight. And then like two minutes later, she's like, I make a beautiful chicken parmesan. You got to try. And I'm like, well, this is the reason why I'm fat. No, because you tell me that I'm losing weight, but you're offering me all this frigging food. And so I made stuff like that and that did well. Um, but I deleted it. I don't know. I was just scared. It really was. When did you decide to monetize your work? Great question. So actually my dad was the one who was like, you know, my dad's been in business for a long time. Sharp guy. Uh, he's like Superman to me. And he was like, you know, you really got an opportunity here, Nick, to make some money. And like, I didn't know what that meant at all. I'm like, I was, laugh. I'm not laughing. No, at no. Thing. I just, every, no, every time I hear your, your voice, I'm picturing one of your, the video yeah. where you're, you do the nah, camera filter. No, go ahead. No, I'm thinking you should laugh. It's funny. And uh, every day he'd be like, you know, let's do something. We could start this and we could start making this and, and then you could come. And I'm like, it was all overwhelming because there were so many people that were reaching out and I was getting so much attention. And just the thought of like monetize, I didn't even know what that meant. You know, like I was always entrepreneurial. I always, like whenever I needed to make money, it wasn't what job am I going to go get? It's like, how am I going to figure out how to make my next dollar? And I would like sell shit on eBay. I'd buy shit for low, sell it high. I'd sell my old clothes. Like I did the personal training thing. So it was always in me, but it, I never really understood that that was different from other people. Um, not in a bad or a good way. It was just different. And so the idea of having like a business scared me, but then November of 2020, I started doing cameo and basically uh, people pay you to like do personalized messages. And I started my price at $6. And I was like, all right, if I do five of these, I can get a bacon, egg and cheese in the morning, have some money left over, maybe get Chipotle later in the day and I'll be good. And that's how I thought. So I would just do five of them every day. And then I would get like a hundred, 200 requests. And I was like, Oh shit. Like, you know, the demand is definitely there. So maybe we should up the price a little bit. And then I, it got all the way up to like $150 for these cameos. And I couldn't rub two nickels together before this. Like if I made 20 bucks, I spent 40 and had no idea what money was. And I had sitting on like four grand, like the most money I've ever made. Um, I don't know if that math is correct. It might not be, but it was like a lot of money. I remember. And um, I turned to my dad one night and I was like, all right, man, listen, I don't know what this shit means, but I'm, I'm in. And so I wrote out like Nikki cash media, what it means to work for Nikki cash media, like our pillars, all this stuff. Um, cause that's just kind of like how I am. And yeah, I, it, I started in November, 2020 and it was like, that was the scariest year of my life, dude. I didn't know what the hell was going on. People are reaching out. You're like doing all these deals, having these conversations. And it was just like, Oh man, you second guess yourself all the time, but thank God. Thank the Lord, you know. I don't know. It's uh, It's been fun. But yeah, November 2020 is when I started. What made you hire Perry and Lucas? How did you find them? Were there any other potential candidates that you had to sort through? So Perry is uh, my best friend. We were roommates in college. I met him freshman year. Actually, he's over here taking a sales call to the right. Um, and I hired him um, because I needed a lot of help. 
managing my schedule in the beginning when I was at school. Um, and <laughs> to be honest with you, I just couldn't fathom um, not being around him after we graduated college. So I was going to do anything and everything to make sure that uh, we were still going to be close and remain in contact. And once I knew that I wanted Perry around, I kind of like figured out how he could one, do something that he likes to do and two, like help us. Um, so he, uh, he manages my social and he does all the content scheduling and all that sort of stuff. Um, he's like my right hand man and Lucas. Um, and I like, I can't, I can't be in this position without Perry because Perry friggin like make sure that everything is in order. And I don't have to think about when a post is going up or when something's due. Cause he just kind of handles it. And he's just an absolute gem. And then Lucas is actually, I met Lucas. He went to my high school and he's five years younger than me. Um, uh, he's, I think he's 19 now, but he had a show his senior year of high school called the Red Hawk Roundup. I went to Nyack High School. Um, he called it the Red Hawk Roundup and he shot me a message on Instagram and was like, Hey, I know you're a Nyack graduate. We'd love to like have you come in on my show, Red Hawk Roundup. I'm like, sure, whatever. So I'm, I'm of course, I go in and, uh, he's got this whole production. Like he's got three cameras. He's shown me his editing software. He's got this computer. Yeah. We record it here and then we upload it. And I, I edit like on, on uh, Adobe premiere and I make these clips and I'm like, like you, you need a job. And he's like, he like sort of laughed. And I said, dude, here's what I'll do. I, I, I had this, I quizzed him. He has no idea that, that I was quizzing him, but uh, I sent him a one minute, no, a five minute video of me taking golf swings and like using like mic'd up content. And I said, I want you to take this five minutes, put it down to 59 seconds and tell a story. But what he didn't know is I did the same exact thing. And then at the end, I was going to compare my version and his version. Well, his version and my version were like identical. And I was like, all right. And in the rule of like editing, you know, they say if you can get it to 80% of what you could do, that's 100% better than you doing it. So he was like 99.9%. .9%. I'm like, all right. So I would start feeding him work here and then. I, luckily, we've been able to hire him full time. Uh, for the summer and he does part-time work while he's back at school. But uh, yeah, I, I, I found them uh, cause they were close to me and I just, I'm a big believer in people and there's certain skills that you can't teach. And I want to have as many people with non-teachable skills um, around me that kind of get it. And then I could teach them the skills or we could learn the skills together, but I'm huge on, on just building the foundation of good people and, like if Lucas isn't excited to do his work, Lucas is wasting his time and I'm wasting his. Perry, the same thing. So like I'm always like trying to figure out how to make these guys excited and kind of just be the leader, but also be collective as a unit um, to, to keep the needle moving forward. And there really weren't any other candidates, but um, I'm sure I, I think coming soon, we're going to have some opportunities to do some interviews and stuff like that. But from the jump, it's just like people I knew. And like I said, I just couldn't, bad and leaving college and not having Perry around because Perry and I are like a married couple. A lot of people say <laughs> it's like, we just got that relationship, best friends, like brothers, but he's one way I'm another, but I wouldn't want it any other way. Did you realize right away that you could break the bank? No, not at all. I, and that's a thing too. Like I, I always, and I, and I say this in a, I think I find money in business to be like a game almost like I'm a very simple guy. Um, I never really thought about money. Um, and there's, there's a lot of people would say to me, like, do what you love and the money will come. And I always kind of just like thought about it like that. And I didn't realize I could break the bank until I started to break the bank. So, um, it was never really like a, a driver or a motivator. It just kind of was supplemental to my obsession with like, pursuing self-improvement and like I mean it when I say it kind of like I don't know if, if you could just be better than you were yesterday and you could and I say all the time like chase the man that's required for the next level of whatever's to come like if you could chase the man everything else is kind of going to just follow um so I never really realized that I could break the bank until the bank started to break but in business too it's like you know you could bring in all this money but if you're smart, you take that money and you reinvest it into people to try and make more money. And for me, that's how you play the game almost. And it's not like, you know, I want to make more money because I want to buy more things. 
I want to make more money because then I'm going to have a higher score. Like it goes back to that, that principle of just like, it really is just a game. And as long as I can go into the grocery store and buy some organic meat and have some potatoes and like do a nice meal for the people I love. I mean, I really, I, I don't, I don't need no Lamborghini or anything like that. What, what was it that changed on the business side from, from cameo going from $6 to 150? What was the biggest thing? I mean, was that it or were there sponsorships or what was the big? It, uh, yeah, it was, it was realizing that a lot of um, brands are paying for audience and I have an audience of my own and I'm not selling myself as an influencer no, when you work with Nikki Cash Media, we're giving you a targeted demographic. We're giving you creative content and we're posting that content to a specific niche that is relative to what you're trying to target. So with uh, our recent sponsorship with Cadillac, first of all, great people. Second of all, great product. They're trying to get into a market that's sort of between that 25 and 45 year old range of people that are kind of on the cusp of like electric versus non-electric. Well, I'm 89% that demo in the Northeast and people are coming to view my content on a daily basis. If we mix in the comedy with the advertisements, we're undefeated and I could translate that message really well. So when I realized that the creative is valuable along with the audience and I can combine those two and package it up along with like data analytics of like, you know, people, uh, impressions, views, all that stuff. It kind of just went from here to, boom like it was like an immediate just tick up and i think a lot of influencers or creators um, need to start understanding that it's not really about them it's about the reason why you do what you do and your content helps people in a way but it's also an avenue for brands that are looking to implement um, some marketing into where people are going which is like instagram tiktok twitter um, you could definitely monetize it that way and once i did that it's been great. Now the next step is like, how do I create something that is transferable? So I don't have to be the one on camera and I can do implement the strategies and um, techniques and kind of just all the inner workings that we do and kind of help somebody else and, and watch them grow. Cause that's the most rewarding thing for me. Nick, in your, in your, uh, you're in the business side of the creation world, you've got, you've got Nikki cast media is your goal, like if you had, uh, if everything goes to plan, is it something like a barstool sports is it something like, you know, Nelk boys, something like that, or is it something different? Nah, I, uh, I really want to like, I really want to, I'm a blue collar normal guy. And I think like that sort of realm, you're kind of dipping into a lot of like celebrity travel and stuff like that. I want to create the same feeling that I got for other creators businesses and podcasts so for me the avenue is like be the guy behind the scenes that's writing out all the content of like here's how you if you if you're just getting started on social media here's what you should do if you're a business here's how you can create more uh leads like all this sort of stuff that we do teach it to a team of people and have that team of people go out and help other creators realize and other brands and people realize the value of social media in a very boutique way um that's kind of the the model for me and where I want to go is like that agency to where like it's, it, you're going to, you work with us. We're going to give you the creative, but we're also going to help you get into the, in front of the right people. And if you're a creator and you want to make more money as a, uh, on the brand side, like here's all of our connections. Let's see if we can find a, a mix or a match and kind of just help you. And, and, and on the coaching and consulting side, like I'll never forget. I had a, uh, a guy's name is Greg, Steve Griggs. He's 60 years old. He's uh, been in business for 40 years with his uh, contracting company. And we he has a social media. And he was like, I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. And um, we built his audience up pretty well. And then um, I started saying like, all right, like now we're going to take your audience and we're going to go sell it as a package to like the people that you buy your materials from and either give you a discount on your materials. So now your margins are going to increase. What's so going to give you more revenue or we'll do like an affiliate code to, if you're buying products that other homeowners are going to buy, you could sell them on your, uh, on your page where people are coming for this sort of stuff and make a little bit of commission. He goes, man, I've been in business for 40 years. I've never been more excited to be doing what I'm doing. And like when I heard that, I was like, I mean, I want to do this for as many people as humanly possible because 
we live in a day and age now where you don't have to work a nine to five and be miserable. Like you can, if you like to cook, you can make cooking content and do it every day and make it a good living and have a community and, and do the things you love to do and be flexible with your time. So that's kind of the direction I want to go because I'm not, like I said, I'm extroverted, but I also am introverted. I don't need to be in front of the camera. I don't need to be in front of the crowds. Like I kind of avoid crowds. Um, I'm kind of like a very low key guy. I like to do the same shit every day and just work towards a goal. So, yeah. Let's play this out. Uh, if we came to you as a consultant, what advice would you have for us with this podcast? <laughs> All right. Um, I think just at, at, right off the bat, I would say just the consistency of the, like, I just feel like everybody has something to bring to the table and something to offer. And you guys have plenty to offer. And I think maybe you're just kind of going on one medium right now. I'd love to see maybe uh, some graphics of uh, moments from the podcast or stories, Mr. Green or Troy, that you could that you could share. That's kind of like off the cuff of what you guys are already doing. And another tip that you guys could do is post stories on Instagram and then watch the people who are viewing your stories. It's unreal. It's like a it's a free way to find to like subgroup your your audience. And you could find all the public accounts and you could shoot them a message and you can kind of just be like, Hey, check out our latest episode or thanks for joining us. If you have anything that's paid, I don't know if you're doing this to make money or just to do, um, just to do it for fun and grow an audience and community. I'm not hundred percent sure, but meeting the people that are viewing and getting an understanding of the people that are viewing your stuff is always valuable because, um, it's important for, the viewers because they're taking time out of their day to and view your guys' stuff. But it's also important to you to know who's really like involved in the stuff you're putting out. Yeah, perfect. We 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 do make money. We have a couple of sponsors and we uh we Love donate that. we use most of the money to reinvest them back in the episode and then we take a big chunk and do uh we donate to ALS research amazing. and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see that's amazing. I mean, yeah. I mean we could I I could talk for days about this, but we can uh we have we'll with our it. with our episodes. One of the things I've noticed is we have very very different episodes, right? So one up one week will be ALS medical stuff. The next week will be you know an NFL player. And yeah, we've actually had people say to us like people that we know, not like not like people being uh, you know negative or haters or whatever. Like people will be like, hey, I love all the sports ones. Listen to all of them. Can't I don't I don't know what to do with the medical ones though, and then right, we have people right. say the exact opposite. So that's one that, thing too is like we're that's we're great in though. a lot of different areas. Yeah, see, it's, I think that's great though. I think you can even and and like I, I have a I have Nikki Cash the Instagram, and I also have the Entrepreneur Nikki Instagram, and that could be and I do that to segment like who's focused on this and who's focused on this. It might be a, a, a cool thing to do two separate shows. I don't know if that's a bandwidth issue, but you could do a sports one that's focused on something specific. And then you could also do the ALS one. You never know. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of doing this is you're, you're the one holding the pen. I got to negotiate with, with him though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that I'm staying out of. <laughs> he was very, he has very, very uh, specific demands for the, for the podcast. He had to be able to, as he should, he had to be able to talk about religion every episode and we had to raise money oh, I love for ALS. Oh, uh, awesome. I love that. Well, it's, it's, it's just a matter of time. It's coming. Oh, good. <laughs> Imagine how that one went with Adam. <laughs> you don't get deep, man. <laughs> You don't get deep. I try to pull it out of him. You don't get deep. He will. He will one day. Have you ever met Derek Jeter? And did he say that quote to you about business? No, no. I I, I have yet to meet Jeter. Um, the day I do will be one of the craziest moments of my life. Um, but I got that quote from watching his documentary where he said, loyalty one way is stupidity. And um, I just love how he had so much grit and there's actually the, the sign uh, behind me is the, the definition of grit, but he had so much grit and um, he said a lot of nothing in interviews. And I just respect that so much, man. Like he was just there to play ball and just be a baseball player and be a captain of the team. And I haven't met him yet, but 
uh, yeah, I look at his stuff all the time. And I think it's, I think that's a tremendous quote. And that was something for me that was hard to understand in the world of business when I first started. Cause like, I was such like, you know, I'm, I'm the nice guy, you know? Oh, yeah, no, I'll do that. Yeah, sure. Let me go do this. Yeah, oh, bro, I got you, dude. You, you need me. I got you, bro. Don't worry about it. I got you. And like that kind of pigeonholed me into like, nah, this fucking kid, just tell him to do it. He'll fucking do it. And I didn't really realize what my value was. Um, and I did a lot of stupidity when it comes to loyalty, uh, being one way. And so, um, I always think back to that and, and in a, in a very tasteful way, understand like business is kind of cutthroat and business is kind of ruthless and you have to understand your value. So that quote's just been really, it's been huge for me. My dad and Jeter wrote three books together. Oh, really? That's yeah, incredible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'll, I'll send it to you after baseball. Genius I would love to. First one. No shit. Oh, I would love to read that. Yeah, I'll send you there's some clips on it and stuff like that. I'll shoot it to you after this. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man, that'd be great. You have taken your ventures so seriously that you have immersed yourself in all kinds of self-help things. Stuff like stoicism, the seven habits of highly effective people, meditation, and writing down all the things that make you happy. Have you read any books by Malcolm Gladwell? No, I haven't. I haven't. What did, what has he written? Out, outliers is one of his most famous ones. And it's like the difference between people who are like the outliers, right? The people who are way, way. Oh, dude, that just gave me chills. I'm in. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's an all timer. That's one of my all time favorites. I got a couple others for you too. There's like, there's a book called shoe dog by the founder of Nike, Phil Knight. Yeah. Nike, Phil Knight. Yep. Got that one. That's a great one. That's awesome. And then one that's not as popular is called the gambler. It's about this okay. guy named Kurt Kaporian. He started MGM studio, like MGM grand, all that in Vegas. He started just right. unbelievable. Yeah. All right. I'm in. Dude, I, I love, dude, I love reading. And I hated reading when I was a student. Now, like just me the too. idea of reading a good book, like it just gets me going, man. Right now I'm reading, uh, I got a good one for both of you guys. The And you got to get the audio book version because he narrates it himself. 50 cent, bear with me, 50 cents. Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter is one of the best books I've ever read. And I've read a lot of great books. And his perspective on life is just so like humbling and also uh, very uh, transferable and understandable because he has like the top level and then like the lowest of low from like kind of his upbringing. And he kind of just very poetically illustrates the entire course of his life and where he got to be in like it is just incredible. So I definitely got to read Outliers. So I've heard, I've heard of that book actually too. One of my good friends is the uh, mental performance coach for the Cleveland Guardians. And he had talked about that book. And we, we talk about being outliers all the time. It's like a, a common term that we use. Um, and not in like a cocky way, just in like a, it's just, we think we're just different. And um, we kind of lean into that. So I'm, that excites me. I wanted to, I'd love to read that. That's really good. I know your godmother meant the world to you. How does she figure into your mental hygiene? Every day, every day. Uh, my godmother taught me a lot of things. And um, when you meet me, you meet her. And every day, I feel like she was just so big on honoring your emotions, not running from the things that hurt you and embracing everything because everything that you experience in life is from God and God is beautiful and life is beautiful. So the bad has to have some sort of positive in it. Um, because by nature and by God, nothing that happens to you is inherently bad. And I know that that's an extreme way to think. And a lot of people may be like, what the fuck does this kid saying? And I get it. Um, but she always just in just burned in my brain that you need to honor every single emotion that comes into your life and you need to be as present as humanly possible. Um, and I think about that every single day. Um, cause at the end of the day, if you don't, you're not actually living. And like that just kind of struck me when she passed, um, you know, for me, it was, it was, uh, 
it was like a moment where like, I kind of had a realization that, you know, time is very finite and all the things that happen to us are for a reason. And sometimes that reason fucking doesn't make any sense, but, um, she is the reason I've been able to kind of just be slow and a very fast paced, uh, thing. And sometimes like I kind of lose that a little bit, but, um, yeah, she was the most wonderful, passionate, um, incredible woman besides my mother. And she was also big on how fear, like the idea of fear is just a feeling, just like happiness. And nobody is going to run away from something that's happy. So why are we running away from things that scare us? Um, within reason, obviously, like don't go jump off a cliff and see what happens. But um, like those kinds of things are really just always at the forefront of my mind. And actually, I have a sign that she gave me for my 13th birthday that I keep right in front of my computer. And it says, what would this, I'm fucking 13. Okay. Just give me a little, a little perspective on the kind of woman she was, but uh, it says, what would you attempt if you knew you could not fail? And like, I just, it's just a constant reminder of like, at the end of the day, like failure is not really a thing. And it's just, everything is an opportunity to learn. And it's a, it's a very like out there sort of way of thinking, correcting a lot of people. But for me, um, she's just been, she's been great. And she's just, I don't know. She was just so relaxed all the time. Like, fuck it. I don't know. Fuck, fuck it. Everything's great. Oh, my car broke down. Fuck it. I get to do, I just get to sit and relax and look at the trees. Like it's just an opportunity for that. And she lived it every day. And so, yeah, she's uh very prominent in everything that I do. And I appreciate you asking that question. Cause it, it excites me to share that to uh, the world and whomever's going to hear it. I have to share this with you, Nick. You might be familiar with it because of your Italian heritage or maybe not, but the best self-help book I have read is the Bible, namely the New Testament. Jesus' wisdom comes straight from God. It's incredible, really. I learned this in my late 50s, and I wish I had learned it sooner. Yeah. Um, man, you really saved the hard-hitting one for last, huh, Mr. Green? <laughs> um, yeah, the... Uh... The Bible is my favorite book of all time, and I haven't been able to read the whole thing. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more. And the four Gospels, even, if you just get to read the four Gospels, I think there's so much wisdom. And, it, and, and, and it's like, it's perfect. Like, the book is perfect. The, the way that it's transcribed, the way that things come through through Jesus and through the, the, the word of God, like it's hard. It, it, it is just, if, even if you don't believe, I always tell people just open up the book and just see for yourself, like just take the step to read maybe the book of Matthew and just kind of, just kind of ponder the idea of like, this was written during the time where Jesus, the Messiah is here to present it. And there has to be a reason why it relates to your situation perfectly. And you can relate to it as if it was happening right now. And I think the, I, I just can't, it's just overwhelming in terms of like how monumental that, that book is. And even if you just view it as a book, um, but my faith um, and I'm not, I'm not a preacher, but I also don't shy away from talking about it. Um, I just think having a faith in general um, is just, I, I just, it's hard for me to comprehend people that don't believe in something. And so, um, yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that. And that book is, uh, it's a self-help book. It's a self-motivating book. It's an understanding book. It's, it's perfect. Like it's perfect. I, and I, perf I refuse to think any other way. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I always tell people too, like, Hey man, you can read all these self-help books, but just open up that good book, dude. Open up the word, man. You'll be all right. Just read a couple of sentences. You'll see. Um, and it's just, yeah, that's incredible. I appreciate that. I heard you say that you are not going to be able to enjoy your success completely until you have kids to share it with. So my question is, are you any closer to that goal? Is there a Mrs. Nikki Cass waiting in the wings? Wow. Um I tell you what, Mr. Green, I found me the one for sure. I found the winner, but uh, I'm 24 years old and 
it's my dream to have just a litter of kids and a huge family uh, of my own. And it's on the way. It's just not on the way anytime soon. But I tell you what, I'm, I'm making all the right steps and I really have, I really have uh, a one of one, man. I, I can't, I can't, uh, I've just been blessed with just an incredible lady by my side. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely on the right path to get there. It's just, we got a couple of, couple more steps to go. You know, I got to move out of the garage. You know, we got to kind of, you know, do that old thing. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I love it. I appreciate it very much. She's, uh, she's the best. They, uh, they don't make them like her anymore. She's out of stock, but yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be great. Like Troy, Troy's got a whole litter. I mean, the guy's got four kids. All right. right. You know, I started at 25, um, Nick, there's a little pressure on you. Yeah. Ah, fuck, man. Now we'll, we're going to get there, dude. Uh, it's definitely, that's my, that's my, like, that's my dream is to have a big ass family, a bunch of kids and a pizzeria that I could go to every day after I've sold all parts of my businesses or whatever. And they run themselves. And that's just like, I make pizza for my, my town and they come to me and it's just an experience every day. That's what I want. I just had baby number four. So if you want to see what it's like without having the kids, you can come. I haven't seen Yeah, no, I definitely need to see that. <laughs> yeah, I definitely got to see that. <laughs> God bless. That's awesome. Do you are you are you joking about a pizzeria or you literally want to have a no, pizzeria? No, I'm, I'm dead serious. No, I'm dead serious. I'm gonna I'm gonna call the name of it's gonna be Rosalie. It's gonna be uh like a I don't know if you've ever been to Lucali in Brooklyn, but I want it to be kind of like an old school vibe, um, where and again, this is going to sound corny, but you come in strangers and you all leave his family. Like I want to, you, you come in and like, if I got prosciutto that I picked up the day before, like I'm going to come over to the table and like, try this. I just got this. You going And then we're going to like have set menu items for like that are the staples, but then I'll get, I'll get crafty in there too. And, and like make some stuff up. I, I, it's always been a dream of mine to own a restaurant. I just, I love to take care of people. I love to serve. And Well, who is she? Her name starts with an L. I like to keep it very. I like to keep that part of my life very low key because, <laughs> you know, social media is. She has no social media, which is incredible. Um, the first thing she said to me, "I have no social media," and I'm like, "God, you know, like this soon, you know." Um, and I just I like to keep it low key because I I, I don't want to expose her to the kind of like the I don't know. I, I like to keep that part of my life private because. It's it's sacred to me, and and you know, when one day, Mister Green, you're gonna meet her, and you'll shake your shake your hand, and you'll be like, oh, now I understand why, um, and it's gonna be great. But her name starts with an L. She's five foot two, this little Italian. She's a fireball, but she's also great, very calming at the same time. And uh, yeah, I, I love her to death. That's who she is, man. <laughs> Don't ask it again if that's your guarantee. <laughs> I was going to ask it again, but I'll let you off the hook. <laughs> Finally, can you tell us the story of how you became friends with star NFL running back Christian McCaffrey? Yes. So uh, Christian followed me on Instagram one day, and he was playing in Carolina. It, scared, it was like, I was like, holy shit, Christian McCaffrey. Like, I, dude, I love Christian McCaffrey. Um, when I was in high school, kind of like looked up to him in the league and whatnot. Um, Cause you know, we got similar builds, looks like me. Like we kind of like had the similar vibe, works hard. Uh, I'm definitely more handsome, but that's another story. He, uh, <laughs> he followed me on Instagram and I like, shot him a message and I was like, Hey man, appreciate the love. Like God bless, whatever. And he hit me back. He was like, dude, I'm a big fan. I was like, what the fuck? What? Big fan of me? I'm like, I'm, I'm fucking picking my ass in my house. Like eating fucking ground beef. Like you're a fan of me. And so I remember I posted a video of me doing like squat cleans on my Instagram story. And he wrote me a book on how I need to change my form. And I was like, okay. And he was just come down to Charlotte and train with me and I'll, I'll fix you up. I'm like, done. Boom. Flew down to Charlotte, met Christian, met everybody, like all his buddies. Um, great crew out there. Paul, Timmy, like all those guys, great crew. Um, and we just kind of like hit it off, like very similar minded, um, just like a very mutual. We say, we say all the time, like we both kind of looked at each other and just went, all right, 
and now we're like good buddies. Like we're, we both have that like sort of like, I don't want, I don't know how to say it, but like very alpha mentality. And it's kind of like when two of them kind of collide, like just a very mutual understanding of respect of each other. And we like bust balls and joke around, but uh, we had that like same demeanor almost. And uh, he's just been monumental in a lot of things that I never thought I had to deal with. He's been there for me to help me deal with them in terms of like fame and, and how to go about this situation, how to go about that situation. Um, and I was just recently at his wedding. It was a beautiful time. He's surrounded by great people, the most humble dude around and, uh, works out like a fucking animal, like an absolute animal. And, uh, when I say animal, like he does a lot of animal movements, like he warms up, like replicating like a lizard and like doing like these different weird movements. Like I'm not kidding (laughs) at all. The first time he did it, I was like, I'm definitely just not in the right place. But, um, he, uh. He's been just monumental for me and just really lucky to call him a friend. And uh, it really bothers me seeing people just rag on him because he gets injured. And uh, I just wish that if everybody took their job as serious as he did, uh, this world would be a lot better of a place, man. So that's how I met. We continue to be connected very, very close, speak a lot. You've met a lot of, you know, really high profile people and been in a lot of cool situations with it. What's, What's one or two of your favorite ones that you've ever done or p- favorite people you've ever met? Uh, definitely when I met uh, Aaron Judge um, doing the Yankees clip was was really cool because like Aaron Judge is, you know, he's captain of the Yankees. He's just like that's, it's just unbelievable. And he's the nicest human being, um, so down to earth, a man of his faith, um, just very genuine and like very calming energy. It's, it's just very, I go, I go off like, how I meet people based off of like energy and feeling my godmother taught me that. Um, and the other one is, uh, actually Mario Carbone, the owner of, uh, the Carbone restaurants, major food group. Um, I would not be as confident as I am in the world of business and creativity if it wasn't for meeting him, because he's just another guy that's maniacal about, I'm going to start using that word everywhere. He's maniacal about a lot of things. Um, and he's just always there and he's built just an absolute monster of a, of a business. And, um, he's been there for me, just kind of been a mentor for me. And it's just been really cool. Him and Gary Vaynerchuk and his whole team have just been like, just incredible. And now Tim Green and Troy Green are up there too. You know what I mean? Well, we, yeah, we, we can't say that much, but we can say, and I'm saying we, I'm jumping on the bandwagon. We can say we taught you maniacal. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. I'm going to start using every every day now. We ha- Guys, I'm going to say it to Perry and Lucas. We got to be maniacal about our systems. If our systems are not That's fucking funny. in line, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. I, I found, so somebody sent me that speech. One of my old teammates sent me that speech. It's online somewhere. I'll send it to you. Please do. That's That's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, he's like, you got to be maniacal when you're running and you're throwing up on yourself because you're running so much. You just keep running. You don't even turn your head to the side. You just <laughs> run right through it. I love it. I love people, it. People are like, people come up to it are like, is he really that? Is he really doing that stuff? I said he was really doing that stuff. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he was. I'm sure That's he was, great. man. You know what? I almost forgot to ask you. In one of your posts, I saw you were trying to break ninety in golf. So, have you broken ninety yet? Sore subject, Mr. Green. I got to be honest with you. It's just, I, you know, I haven't done it yet. And, uh, you know, I've really, I'm hating golf because of it. And it's just been a grind out there, dude. It's war on that golf course. And uh, a lot of people, they have fun going out and playing 18. I dread it every time. It's just, I got to take a break from the sticks for a little bit. I haven't done it yet, but I will. Do you have a favorite, uh, you know, character that you do in your kind of skits? I love doing, I love doing the, I love doing the pizza guy just because like, I just love the vibe of like the pizza shop. Um, and I love, I love doing, uh, Coach Al because Coach Al is just so much fun, man. Just putting on the belly and the, the baseball uniform that it's just the easiest thing to do because I, I, it's based off of like coaches that I've had. So like when I go and, and do the, the impression, it's just like, I don't know. It's very easy for me to do. So I love those two, but I love them all. 
And then if, if there's a, you know, a listener who's a, you know, young wannabe comedian type person, what, what one, uh, I'm sure there's a million things, but if you could only tell them one piece of advice, what would you give them? Just start like, and, and like, when I say just start, eliminate all thoughts of what if and what not, and just do one thing every day that's going to put you in the right direction. If you want to post videos tomorrow, just download the app. And then the next day, make a video and keep it in your camera roll. And then the day after that, post that video and see what happens. And understand if that there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do no harm. And you need to leave the opinions of others on the ground because it ain't going to lift you up. And that's probably what I would say to anybody who wants to start something. You start. Start small. Now on to our final word segment where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? <laughs> Bro, start over. I mean, that, like, what the, I need that one answer with that. <laughs> Fuck. No, it doesn't have, to be, doesn't have to be one word as much as you want, but we'll, we'll... <laughs> Damn, the happiest moment of my life. The one that I could think about... Uh, the, the quickest, um, taking my mom to her first Ranger game, her dad, uh, I never met him. My grandfather, uh, loved the Rangers and Adam actually hooked up the tickets and, and taking her to the Ranger game, uh, was just fucking incredible for me. What is the biggest adversity you faced? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. My God, my godmother passing away. Um, my godmother passed away. Yeah. Yeah. That was the that was the toughest thing I probably had to. She was like my second mother. What are you most excited about? Having a family, um, and building it, continuing to build a team of people that are excited to show up every day to work, and when they go home, they're excited to tell their wives or their husbands how their day was. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? I'm just honored. I'm grateful to be uh, on this show with you guys. I appreciate you thinking of me. Shout out to Adam Fox. He is an absolute gem. Um, it's no coincidence that you guys get along with him. You guys are incredible. And uh, yeah, I would. I saw that there was recommendations uh, that you got, and that's how I got on this one. I would say uh, you got to get a guy named Logan O'Hoppy on here. He's uh, the catcher for the Angels. I can make the introduction if you'd like. He is an incredible candidate for this podcast. Um, and I just would like to say that that's pretty much it. Uh, every day you wake up, you got two choices, to be positive or to be negative. And I hope that most people choose the positive ones. And we believe the stories that we tell ourselves. So make sure you tell yourself the right story. That's what I want to say. That's Guys, great. Thanks. Yeah, you're the, first, you're the first, uh, first guest ever to beat me to the recommendations. So I don't even get oh, to ask sorry. you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, man. <laughs> No, I'm thrilled. <laughs> and that's oh, yeah. an awesome recommendation. So yeah, I'll follow up with you after. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, after this, just take my number and we'll uh, we'll communicate there. Nikki Cass, it's been a great pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for your valuable time. I said it was an honor to speak to you and you didn't disappoint. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your questions and I appreciate you bringing up uh, my godmother and talking about your faith in the Bible because I think that's super important too, so... Much appreciated. And my girlfriend's name is Lucia. All right. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the freaking podcast. <laughs> Cut the tape. Nick, thanks for joining us. And it's I'm excited to see. Uh, it's funny because when we were prepping for your episode, we had Leslie Stahl on. He's a very famous, well-known reporter for 60 Minutes. Yeah. And she's eight, she's 82. And when we were talking to her, she said, my, my real professional life, like it really didn't start till I was 30. And I was saying, you know, Nick, you're you're a younger guy. I'm like, if you think about just how it's crazy how much you've done in such a short time. And uh, I'm excited. We're excited to see, you know, where life takes you. So stay in ah, touch. And thanks that. so much again for doing the episode. Hey, two way street, fellas. Thank you. God bless. I appreciate it. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern US, Washington DC, and Toronto, 
go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com. Thank you.